I had planned to spend a week camping and exploring Voyagers National Park in northern Minnesota in the summer of 2015. Voyagers is pretty remote, and to be honest, I was a little nervous traveling solo up there. There are only two campsites in the entire park that don't require a boat to access. I had done quite a bit of solo travel in the past, and I told myself that everything would be fine. I had just seen the movie Backcountry, which is a gruesome film about a predatory black bear that attacked two campers in Canada. I blamed that for my uneasiness, and I brought two extra cans of bear spray. It was a five-hour drive to the park, and my fears seemed to settle by the time I reached the park in the early afternoon. I had reservations for two campsites during my trip. The first was only a 20-minute paddle from the lot where I parked my truck. The second campsite, which I had planned to reach on Thursday, was a great deal more remote. As soon as I reached the forest on the other side of the river, my fears returned. Looking back, I now know it was the silence. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's what it was. And it wasn't just the kind of silence you get when the animals see a human in the forest. It was like the whole landscape was frozen. Nothing moved at all. Not the wind, not the leaves on the trees, or the clouds in the sky. There were no birds, no squirrels, no bugs, nothing. Like I said, I didn't realize what it was at the time. I just knew something was very wrong. I kept my bear spray close as I set up camp. The strange silence would come and go throughout the evening, and I did my best to ignore it. But what came later, I could not ignore. It was a stench. An ungodly, rotten stench. I was putting out my fire for the night, and suddenly it smelled like the whole forest had died. The smell was everywhere. I looked around for the source, but I couldn't pinpoint it. I circled around the campsite, and the smell was just as strong on one side as it was on the other. I didn't know what it was. The only thing I knew is that I did not want to be in the woods that night. But then the smell disappeared after maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And I mean, completely disappeared. As if nothing had happened at all. I went to bed about an hour later, and I didn't think about the strange smell anymore that night. Over the next few days, I would encounter that smell on and off. It wouldn't last longer than 30 minutes, but it was an all-encompassing event when it happened. It was so bad, I could barely breathe without gagging. After the third time it happened, I realized that it was preceded by that strange, unnatural silence. The forest would get quiet, like it was frozen, and then the smell would arrive. And when the smell disappeared the forest would become alive again. I was averaging about 15 miles a day on foot, and more than that if I traveled the waterways in the pack raft, and somehow the smell would follow me, wherever I went. I thought there must be something medically wrong with me, literally. The forest would go silent, and then it felt like I had lost my hearing, and then this stench would fill the air with no source. It had to be me. I must be having some sort of hallucination, medical emergency. At least that's what I thought at the time. I realized later, I was being followed. I stuck with my plan of reaching the remote backcountry campsite by Thursday afternoon. The trek to get there was mostly by water, and it was in the water when I finally saw what had been following me and causing the horrible smell. I was in my pack raft when I saw a pack of wolves swimming across the river. It was a rare sight, even in northern Minnesota. There are definitely wolves in the backcountry, but they're rarely seen. There were four wolves, and they were swimming with determination. What I didn't notice at first was the elk swimming behind them. I couldn't see its face while it was in the water, just the antlers. And at first glance, I thought it was just a pair of antlers or a skull floating in the water, since elk shouldn't even have a full set of antlers this time of year. But as I watched closer, it was definitely swimming, and it looked like it was chasing the wolf pack. The elk's whole head was submerged under the water. I had no idea how it could hold its breath that long. 
As I continued to watch the scene unfold, that strange silence fell upon the water. I didn't need to wait for the stench to arrive before I knew that whatever was below those antlers was the thing that was following me in the forest. The wolves reached the shore and bolted into the woods. The creature was still swimming. I started paddling upriver from the direction I came. I knew what was going to come out of that water was some sort of monster, and I wasn't about to spend another night out there with it. I had created some distance between myself and the creature, but not enough to feel remotely safe. The creature then emerged from the water, and the stench hit me despite being at least 50 yards away. It was a revolting sight. It had the body of an elk, but it was basically a walking skeleton. Its fur was white and nearly transparent, as was its skin. In some places, I could see the pink of its organs through the skin, but that wasn't even the worst part. It had no hair on its face. I don't even think it had skin. It looked like just a skull with two dark sockets where its eyes should have been, and a gaping hole for the nose. It turned, and it looked at me. It looked as if it was deciding if it should pursue me or the wolves. I had my bear spray, but I also had doubts that it would work on this thing. It watched me for a moment as I very slowly paddled backwards before taking off down the path behind the wolves. I can't tell you how fast I paddled out of there. I haven't been camping alone since, nor have I ever smelled anything like that ever again. But I know that if I do, I'm getting the hell out of the woods before I meet that thing again. Seeing it once was more than enough for me. I can't say I'm happy to be writing to you, but I sure do have a story to tell. I want to be clear and let you know that I know it sounds wild, but it's the truth. And if you don't want to believe it, it's fine. But I have the scars to prove it. I'm a lobster fisherman by trade. I work on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and I earn a pretty decent wage. If you don't mind smelling like the sea, it's not so bad. Last year, my friend and I went in on a new boat together. We were running along as freelancers for a while, but we decided it was about time we become our own bosses and set sail under our own conditions. The first issue with being a captain is finding a crew. Although we have tons of friends in the industry, it's risky to join with a new captain, and there are union benefits in place to prevent movement to a new boat. A few decided to jump ship and come with me, but not enough to run smoothly. So I was a captain without a full crew. For the most part, boats these days can steer themselves, but the boys are needed for maintenance and upkeep on board, and for safety. I don't know what compelled me that day to do it, but I went out alone. It was clear skies and smooth sails, so I never thought that I would have a problem. I was about a mile out to sea when I saw the first clouds roll in. They were thick and heavy, and right away I knew I was done for. The rain and the wind came on fast, and before I knew it, I was fighting against the elements. It was rough and I was scared half to death. My sonar system started to malfunction, and I couldn't get a good read on the map. Little did I know, this wouldn't be the worst thing to happen to me that day. I was pushed to an inlet, the waves were huge and spilling up on my deck. I spotted an old harbor, one that had been abandoned some time ago for a newer set of docks about a half mile north. In my mind, an abandoned harbor means empty docks and a clear spot for landing to sit out the storm. I fought against the waves and wind and I steered over and I did my best to drop anchor. I figured if I could just wait out the storm, I'd be okay. Through the rain and the fog though, I saw a beast approaching. It was walking up the dock on all fours. At first, I thought it was a wolf or a coyote or something, but those things aren't really spotted out on the Cape. And then I think to myself, maybe it's just a big dog, like a pit bull or something. And man, those guys can be mean, but at least you know what you're dealing with. But then it stood up, like on its two feet, up in the air. And it was so tall, really tall. 
and it was mean looking. Its face just looked like a hound, like a German shepherd or something, with fat globs of drool dripping down its chin. It looked me right in the eyes and snarled at me with these sharp yellow teeth. I saw its ears twitch as it pushed through the rain. Well, all this time that it's walking up the dock, I'm just staring over at it and I can't move. It's like I'm paralyzed or something. And it's only when it's like 10 feet away that I realize it's coming right for me now. It was walking slowly, like pacing up a predator. And I didn't know if I should stay in place or freeze or if I should try to get the boat out on the water. It was still pouring and foggy and wavy and windy but I decided that I would rather face the elements out there than face this creature. So I started to untie the knots and roll up the anchor. The waves had been pushing me so close to the dock that I actually had fastened myself right on to keep from hitting it. I needed to lean over the edge to get the boat untied. I tried to do it as quickly as possible, but the rain made the knot slip and tighten, and being near that thing was making my hands shake. I just about had the knot loose when I felt this sharp pain in my arm. The dog thing had taken a whole chomp out of my arm, and it wasn't letting me go. I screamed in pain, but I knew nobody would hear me. I pulled my arm away from the beast and I jumped back. Amazingly, it let me go. I fell onto the boat right on my butt and I had the rope in my hand. The knot had come undone. The beast was perched on the edge of the boat as it started to be set free from the dock. A huge wave splashed over the deck and the entire ship rocked back and forth. The creature looked around at the waves, then it looked at me, and then jumped off the boat and back onto the dock. I don't want to say I'm lucky because I sailed back to shore to the emergency room and I had to get nine staples in my arm. But I'm lucky that I'm alive. The size of the bite meant that the thing was way too large to be a pit bull, or a bobcat, or a wolf. The scar takes up half of my forearm. This had to have been a dog man. It looked just like the descriptions other people have had, and I just can't shake that image of it snarling at me. I hope no one else out on the Cape has to deal with that thing. I know your inbox must be flooded with stories, but this one just might be a bit different than the rest. That's because I've been tracking these ships for some time now, and I'm positive that I've been studying an alien species. This may sound insane, and my family definitely thinks so, but I have a great deal of evidence compiled that could sway even the most ardent non-believer. I'm based in New Mexico, near the border to Mexico. I won't share exact details, but I can describe the general location. It's not a highly populated area, and there's not much out here except the highway and a few rest stops. I have a day job, which I will not reveal, but I do my main investigations at night. You see, the weather here is hot and dry, so it's a lot easier to canvas the area when the sun's not out. Otherwise, you end up with a mean sunburn and possible dehydration. I've been plotting the flight patterns of two spacecrafts. The first is a square-shaped hovercraft that flies pretty close to the ground. It ducks in and out and can do flips and turns. You may have thought at first that it was a drone, but there are no government or recreational drones that have the capability to vanish into thin air. And that's just what it does. It will fly around the desert and near my home base and eventually pick up speed. It'll flash a bright neon blue light and then disappears. It always starts off in the same area at about 9 p.m., and I have followed it for up to a mile. At 3 a.m., it always vanishes, although sometimes it will blink away earlier than that. If I'm not able to keep up with it in my car or on foot, I can sometimes lose it, but usually it moves at quite a slow pace. The second spacecraft is much larger and much more difficult to consistently track. It's more of a traditional UFO. I try not to use that phrase though as it has been so misconstrued by the media and the government, but it looks more like the general public's idea of an alien ship. And you know what? There is clearly a reason that so many people have seen these ships out here in New Mexico and Texas and Nevada. 
It's because this flight path is strategically placed to connect with the gravitational pull at the equator. I can get into this theory more so in private. The ship travels from the east to the west, and I've calculated it to be moving at about 15 miles an hour. Sometimes it'll pause and stop for a moment as a car passes by or an animal walks through the area, but it typically continues at a steady pace. The ship flies at an altitude far lower than a plane, and it creates a ripple effect behind it. There's no chemtrail or anything like that. There's only a ripple of heat or gravitational disturbance that follows in its wake. The first time I spotted it, I happened to be outside letting my dog use the facilities at about 2 a.m. I looked overhead, and I saw it. There's a ring of LED light illuminating the edges of the circular craft but it's otherwise invisible. For the next few weeks, I would set my alarm to go off at 1.50 a.m. and then head outside. I can only speculate on whether these ships are friend or foe, but they're certainly interesting to study. The government bases that are nearby would surely be able to notice these ships on their radar. So I'm unsure why there have been no stories yet released about their presence. The first time I spotted the ship, I created a post on Twitter and on Reddit. And in less than a minute, however, my accounts were banned. I tried to make a new one, but I think they must have been tracking my IP address because I received a pop-up stating that I can no longer access these social media sites. I don't want to attract any more negative attention from these platforms or from the government. So I'm pretty much gonna stop talking about this and I will not be sharing any photos publicly. I was on the police force in Minnesota for about 12 years. The town I was in was so far north that it was basically Canada. Summers were short and humid. Winters were absolutely brutal. In fact, most of the incidents I had to respond to in the winter months were related to bad road conditions in one way or another. This incident happened in the fall of 2010. It was cold, I remember, but there were only a couple of inches of snow on the ground at the time. I was called to investigate a case of property damage at a homestead deep in the woods. The report came in early that morning and said that there was significant damage to the woodshed. I asked if it looked like the perpetrator was an animal, in which case it would be a job for animal control instead, but the caller said there were footprints left behind. I cleared my schedule so I could head out right away. If there were footprints, I could get a size and a tread pattern, but I had to move quickly because as soon as the sun came up, it would start to melt the prints and they would get distorted beyond use. The homestead was an off-grid cabin set up deep in a pine forest. You couldn't see it from the road. In fact, you could barely see the driveway. The only reason I found the place was the lone mailbox at the end of the road. I didn't even see a fire number. I'll be honest, the guy who lived there was a bit odd. I mean, you'd have to be to live in this climate without electricity. He said he spent the last three days chopping wood for the winter as he was a little behind this year. And the woodshed was located about 50 yards from the house. The man claimed to have heard an animal moving around out there for the last two days, but he never saw anything. He thought now that it might have been the person who did the damage to the woodshed but it didn't make much sense as to why someone would have any reason to attack a building. And it looked like an attack, like something you would expect from a bear. The whole side of the shed was torn off and scattered across the ground. Logs from the shed were strewn all over the property. I mean, all over the property. There were logs up near the house and just all over for as far as you could see. The man said he woke up in the night to the sound of the destruction outside, and he opened his door to take a look at what was going on. He claimed to have seen the back of a man who looked to be dressed in a white fur coat. As soon as he opened the door, though, he said the man ran off into the woods. He waited until morning to investigate the damage, and that's when he found the footprints. But here's the strange part. The prints are bare feet. I didn't believe him until he showed me. I mean, they were definitely human prints, although quite large, but that could be explained by the sun. When the sun hits footprints, they melt and get a little bigger. 
I took photos of the footprints and I walked around the perimeter of the shed to record the damage. As I was walking around the backside, I saw a white blur out of the corner of my eye. I spun around to get a better look. The only thing I saw was white fur running into the forest. This must be our guy, I thought, so I chased. I didn't realize until I was about 80 yards into the pine forest that I was not chasing a man. Now it looked like a man from behind, about my height and running on two legs, but it was not a man at all. It then stopped to face me, and it had an ape-like face. The skin around its face and hands were a sort of brownish tan, and the rest of the creature was covered in white hair. I drew my gun. I didn't know if it was going to attack me when it stopped running, but it just stood there, panting, almost like it was out of breath. I then moved my eyes down to its feet. No shoes. This was definitely the creature that destroyed the shed. I don't know what I was thinking, but I tried talking to it. But it was obvious that it didn't have any understanding of language. I still had my gun drawn on it. I slowly reached into my pocket to grab my phone to get a picture of this thing. But that's when it ran, and I didn't follow it that time. My encounter with the creature only lasted at max a few seconds, but it felt way longer than that. I couldn't believe what I had seen, and I had no idea what I was going to tell the man who owned the cabin. I mean, I couldn't put any of this in the police report. I'd probably get fired for suspicions of insanity or something. I couldn't tell the guy it was an animal either since he saw human footprints out there. I decided to protect my own butt and not say anything. I took down the report of the property damage and that was it. I did stay and help the man clean up the logs that had been scattered across his property. And I don't know exactly why, since I had a bunch of other things I was supposed to do that day. I guess I felt guilty for not telling him about what I saw in his woods. I did check up on him again a few weeks later, and when I got there, the first thing I noticed was that the woodshed had been moved right next to the house. I asked about it, and he said the same thing happened two weeks later, two weeks after I left, and he said that he saw somebody out there in the woods but I wouldn't believe him if he told me what it looked like. What he says is the truth. So since he moved the shed away from the forest, he's now not had any issues. Hopefully, it'll stay that way. I spent most of my life as a hunting guide on the border of Montana and Wyoming. I did some work for fish and wildlife in both states. During the off-season, I worked as a range rider tracking wildlife populations and making sure the large predators don't get too close to civilization. I was who they called when they had to track and dispatch problematic wildlife for the safety of the public. It's not what I would call a fun job, but I was really good at it. I was called out to northwestern Wyoming to track down a problematic brown bear. The reports of the bear were just outside of Yellowstone. Oddly, no one had directly seen the bear, but it had caused severe damage to vehicles and campers in the area. All signs pointed toward a territorial bear. The local park service tried to track it down before they called me after having had no success. The most recent report of the bear was from a road crew working to fix some mountain roads that were washed out by recent flooding. Luckily, no one was injured, but the bear destroyed two hard-sided campers that the workers were staying in. That was the last place the bear was spotted, so it was the first place on my list. I'm a little old school when it comes to hunting and tracking, so I drove up there with my truck and horse trailer. I know a lot of guys that use ATVs out here, but a good horse will do you much better. The road up the mountain was windy and slow going. I didn't reach the camp until mid-morning. I saw the damage before I even had my truck in part. The sides of the camper were completely slashed through. Bears can definitely do this kind of damage, but it's not all that common. But every once in a while, you'll get a rogue bear that's just out to get everybody. Like I said, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, the only thing to do is to put the bear down. I talked to one of the workers who was in the camper at the time of the attack. He said he didn't get a good look at it, but saw brown fur. Now that means it's a grizzly. He claimed to have shot at it twice with a 12-gauge dead center in the chest, but said that the bear didn't stop. 
The charging bear does have a lot of adrenaline in its body. They can be mortally wounded and still maul you to death before they die. There's a good probability that the bear was severely wounded and just ran off somewhere to die. At least if this guy was telling the truth. I looked and did find a decent blood trail leading into the forest. I saddled up my horse and set off down the trail, leading her on foot. Had I known that I would be following a track, I would have brought a dog, but the blood trail was substantial enough to easily follow. So from the looks of it so far, I was expecting to find either a dead or nearly dead brown bear very soon. But that was not the case. I followed that track well into dusk. I knew I should have turned back earlier, but I just couldn't imagine an animal that had lost such a significant amount of blood to still be able to go so far. I was in a situation where I would either have to camp or try to travel out through some extremely rugged terrain in the dark. Neither option sounded good to me, but I was too far on this track to give up and come back in the morning. I knew I couldn't sleep out here with a wounded grizzly potentially close by, so I decided to follow the track into the night. The blood on the leaves was still warm, too. This thing was so close, it could probably see me. Certainly smell me. I just wanted to get this bear dead so I could get a good night's sleep out here and then ride back in the morning. Even my horse started getting antsy as we continued on the track. I knew we were nearly there. And that's when I saw a lump of brown fur lying on the forest floor in the shadows. I had my rifle positioned on it, but there was something strange about the situation. I turned the brightness up on my headlamp to get a better look. And the first thing I noticed was that it was still breathing. The second thing I noticed was that its fur, while brown, was not a bear's fur. It was much longer, like something you would see on a yak. I made some noise to see if it would move. I really just wanted to see the face to figure out what it was, but it just laid there. And then my horse suddenly spooked from something moving behind us. I spun around to see what it was, but I didn't see anything between the trees. I looked back at the creature, and it was still laying there in the dirt. And then I heard what sounded like people walking through the forest. It was coming from all directions. And that's when I saw the first one. It must have been seven feet tall, was covered in the same long brown hair as the creature curled up in the dirt. Its face looked almost human, but not quite. Its skin was tan and leathery from what I could tell with my headlamp. My horse was properly freaked out by the sight, as was I, if I'm honest. The creature approached the injured creature on the ground and knelt down next to it. And then another one came from the shadows and joined those two. I didn't know what to do. I knew how to handle an encounter with just about every wild animal out there, but these were something else. It looked like they were trying to help the injured one, and in that moment, I was afraid that they would attack me, thinking I was the one who had shot their friend. So I slowly turned my horse around. The creatures stared at me. I don't know why, but I tried speaking to them. I told them that I was looking for a bear and that I'm not a threat to them and that we were promptly leaving. I can't tell if they understood me or not, but they did let me leave. I rode through the night to get out of there. I continued on working as a ranger rider and a hunting guide for another 12 years after that incident. And I can say, I never saw any of those creatures again, but I have heard stories from others. They aren't very often seen, but they are out there. My grandparents moved down to Southern Florida, the Fort Lauderdale area, back in the early 2000s. As part of our family tradition, we spent almost every holiday with them. It was easy enough to ride along when I was a kid, but once I hit college, it became somewhat harder to go down from the Nashville area where I was going to school. It's a pretty straight shot though, down I-75, but at the very bottom end of the highway, down in Florida, the road cuts straight across the state through Big Cypress Preserve, and a pretty wild stretch of the Everglades. Even as a kid, it struck me as a strange place to build a highway, but it's undeniably scenic. Sometimes you even see alligators sunning themselves along the side of the highway. 
When we were younger and driving down with our parents, my older brother loved to taunt me about all the monsters living in the swamp, and I used to be petrified by the time we got to our grandparents' house. Meanwhile, Fort Lauderdale isn't exactly known for its creepy, crawly creatures, apart from some massive cockroaches, but that never really did much to calm my nerves. Anyway, during college, I was heading down one year for Thanksgiving. It was 2018. I remember specifically because it was the year before Nicole hit, and I didn't make it for the next few years after that. I was on my way down and was pushing harder than I should have to make it. Usually I split up the 14-hour drive into two days, but I had stayed a little longer in Nashville than I first anticipated. That meant I was over 12 hours in when I was crossing into the National Preserve, and admittedly, starting to get punchy. If I really pushed it, I would make it by midnight, which I know for sure my mom was hoping for. It was late in the day, and the sun had been down for so long that I felt like I'd been driving in the dark forever. No amount of passenger seat snacks or caffeine could keep me focused. Besides, once you start cutting through the preserves, especially in the dark, everything takes on this super surreal quality. The nights down there can get super muggy, too and thick fog can come up in a second and hang around in ways that make any kind of travel dangerous. So I was tearing my hair out because all I wanted to do was floor it and cut across that last hour and a half. Instead, fog had me fighting my way through. So, yeah, maybe I was going faster than I should have been, but I felt sure that I would be able to see taillights or headlights in time to miss anything major. And then... All of a sudden, something leapt out of the fog less than 50 feet ahead of me, and I slammed on my brakes. The whole car threatened to go into a spin, and I yanked on the wheel to keep from slamming into the guardrail. It had happened. I was going to hit this thing in the road, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Instinct took over, and I pulled the wheel hard to take the hit in the front passenger side, so that whatever it was didn't rocket across the hood and cave in the windshield. We hit hard and the thing let out a massive yelp and pitched over the shoulder and down into the gully. As I made contact, my heart got tight. In my panic, I hadn't gotten a good look at it, but even in that state, I could tell that it had been standing upright. So, I pulled over, and I got out of the car, terrified that I would look down over and see a person lying in the swamp. The passenger side headlight was busted, so that whole side of the road was dark. Now, my father always insisted that I keep a flashlight in the glove box, so I got that out, and I went over to look down, and the first thing I noticed before seeing anything was the smell. Not exactly like something dead, but more like an ugly mix of B.O. and animal musk. I had to pull the front of my shirt up over my nose to even get close. My heart was pounding because it was definitely shaped like a person, but the more I looked the less that actually proved to be true. The proportions were super weird, like the arms seemed too long for the body. Plus, it was covered all over with this reddish hair like an orangutan. But the legs were too long for it to be that. Everything about it just seemed wrong. That, plus the smell. And all those stories my brother told when we were kids came rushing up like crazy. I know this sounds nuts, but I'm a thousand percent sure that this thing was a skunk ape. My hands started shaking and I climbed back into my car to call my dad to tell him what had happened. At that point, I didn't even know what the damage was to my car and I felt far too rattled to drive right away. As soon as I sat down though, this inhuman wailing started from off in the fog. Not just one, but several sounds, several voices. It was impossible to tell where they were all coming from, but I knew in an instant that whatever the issues with my car might be, there was no way I was waiting around. So against my better judgment, I kicked on my high beams to make up for the lost headlight and I hightailed it out of there, somehow making it to my parents, but with no memory of the drive. When I finally arrived there, my dad was waiting up for me and it all came out. I started shaking and crying I was crying so hard I woke everybody else up in the house. I think my dad at first thought I might have made it all up to keep from getting in trouble for wrecking the car or being later than I had wanted, but 
there was no denying it when he saw me. And so now, we are all affected. I was working at a wildlife preserve in northern Minnesota. We were working on a project to track the population of fishers in the area. Unfortunately, they had been nearly wiped out in the area several years back, and we were making an attempt to re-establish a breeding population. Fishers are problematic to study. They're solitary animals, and they're difficult to track, trap, and collar. Imagine a ferret on steroids with the personality of a wolverine. This project led me into some pretty remote wilderness areas, oftentimes alone. This was one of those times. It was the dead of winter. I had a few live traps set up in an area where we had caught fishers on game camera. Like I said, they're difficult to trap, so I wasn't hopeful to find anything. Still, I had to check them in case something was in there. The trail to get to the traps required a snowmobile to make it through. There were three traps to check, two in a forest and one I had to cross a frozen bog to get to. Luckily, the budget for this preserve didn't allow for one of those nice new snowmobiles, and so I had this machine from the late 70s. I say luckily because this thing was much lighter than the newer sleds, and honestly, that's the only reason I felt comfortable taking it over the bog. I checked the traps in the forest first and found nothing in one, and a raccoon in the other. I released the raccoon and headed towards the bog. I had to drive out of the forest across a prairie area and then down a steep hill to the bog. There was a river running through the area that typically froze in the winter, but I didn't have to cross that. As soon as I got into the prairie, I felt like something was wrong. I couldn't say just what it was. Even looking back, I just sort of knew. I pushed the feeling to the back of my mind, though, and continued on, basically forgetting it. I didn't want to turn around, but I also couldn't leave the trap without checking to see if something was stuck in there. I knew I had reached the bog when I saw the green reeds poking up out of the snow. They were the only bit of color in the entire landscape. Everything else was covered in ice and snow and frozen. I stopped the sled near the trap. I didn't see anything inside, but I smelled something absolutely rotten. We used to use chicken livers for the traps. They're stinky and the fishers like them, but they don't smell this bad. No, there was definitely something else around. I didn't see any animal carcasses near me. In fact, there were no signs of animals at all. Usually when I drive in with the snowmobile, everything on four legs scatters away. But there are usually tracks all over to look at. But this time, there was nothing. The only tracks I found were mine from when I set the trap the day before yesterday. I was just about to get on my snowmobile and go, but then out of the corner of my eye, I saw two elk antlers pointing out of the snow. They were less than 20 yards away from the sled. We do have elk up here in northern Minnesota, but they are rare. This looked to be shed antlers or a skull. It didn't jump up and leave when I came in with the snowmobile, so I assumed it was dead. A set of elk antlers is a pretty neat find, and I wanted to bring them back to the station. But when I approached, the rotting smell overpowered me. Normally an animal carcass won't stink like that during the winter. That should have been my first sign to get out of there. But I decided to investigate further. I really wanted to take those antlers home. As I began to approach what I thought was an elk carcass, something moved beneath the snow. I stepped backwards as soon as I saw it move, but it was tough to move quickly. The creature was slow to rise up from the ground. It moved like it was aged. Its bones clicked and popped, and it was emaciated at best. In fact, I was surprised that it was still alive from the state that the body was in. It had its back to me when it got up, so I hadn't seen the face yet. The fur was as white as the snow. I figured it must be some sort of an albino mutation or something. I got back to my sled and started it up, the elk was close enough that I wanted to put some distance between us in case it decided to charge. And this is when it turned around, and I can't tell you how terrified I was. This thing had fur all over its body, except for its face. And the skin was stripped from the skull. It was just bone from what I could see. And I couldn't see any eyes in the dark sockets, but when it turned to look at me, I know it saw me. 
eyes or not. I didn't see a lower jaw either. I don't think it had one. There was just this flap of pinkish meat hanging down from its throat. It must have been a tongue or something. I was so afraid I was struggling to grasp the pull cord on the snowmobile, and it took three tries to get it started, all while the creature was fixated on me. It then began walking towards me. Its movements were jarring, like its legs weren't connected to the rest of the body. Sort of hard to describe. But then I got the snowmobile running before it reached me, and I sped off. I kept looking back over my shoulder, but it didn't attempt to chase me. I know what I saw wasn't one of those sick or diseased elk. The natives up here have a name for it, but I won't say it here. The legends say that this creature thing is a danger to humans, and I'm lucky to have escaped as easily as I did. I think I woke the beast from a deep sleep, and that must have been why it didn't try to chase me. Hibernation, maybe? I don't know. I don't really know, but I do know that I won't go back into that area alone or without a gun. Hey Lilith, I'm a firm believer in the supernatural. I know it's real and I've had a few experiences to back it up. I was born and raised in Hawaii and while it's mainly known as a tourist paradise with beaches, mountains, surfing, and luau's, there's also a dark side that most aren't aware of unless you live there. Hawaii is ripe with history, folklore, and spirituality, and there are hauntings all over the islands. Popular spirits include Madame Pele, the goddess of fire, the Menehune, the choking ghost, the faceless woman of Waialai Drive-In, and the green lady of Wahiwa. One of the scariest encounters that I've personally had involves the most legendary ghosts of all. In Hawaiian, they're the Huakaipu, but are more commonly known as the Night Marchers. Anyone who lives in Hawaii has at least heard of them. They are very real. The Night Marchers are the ghosts of ancient Hawaiian warriors said to travel on certain trails from sunset to sunrise. Supposedly, they appear during the last four phases of the moon, before it goes dark. It's said that you'll know when the night marchers are coming when you hear their drumbeat and the sound of the shell. You'll see their torches in a single line descending down the mountains. That's your cue to run and hide. You're not supposed to look at them. If you do, they will pull you in and you'll be doomed to walk with them for eternity. You're supposed to show deference and respect by taking your clothes off and laying face down in the ground. If you do look at them, it's possible to be saved by an ancestor who is marching with them. The ancestor will call your name and claim you as theirs, and your life will be spared. Simply put, these are not the kind of spirits to be trifled with. One summer weekend, my cousin and I were camping and boar hunting. I won't say where, because it's best if people don't try to go there. It was near the base of a mountain, and we had to hike a few miles after parking off a dirt road. On our first day, we bagged a boar and cleaned it, then we cooked some of the meat for dinner. We had a few beers afterwards and just talked story, laughing into the late hours of the night. There were no clouds, and the tapestry of stars was a sight to behold. The moon was just a sliver, but I didn't think anything of that at the time. We eventually went to sleep, but a few hours later, my cousin violently shook me awake. I didn't recognize him at first in my half-asleep stupor, and I almost punched him in the face but I quickly saw the terror in his eyes. I had never seen him as scared as he was in that moment. He told me to shut up and listen, and that's when I heard it. A slow, steady drumbeat, and then the sound of the shell blowing. It was in the distance, but not too far away. I looked at him in disbelief. I think I may have even laughed, but he yanked me up with one arm and he pointed at the mountain. Through the trees, I saw it. It looked like floating fireballs streaming down the mountain in a single line. It was them, the night marchers. From out of nowhere, we were hit with a wave of warm air as the drumbeat grew louder and louder. We got up and ran, abandoning our campsite and blindly plowed through the jungle. The sound of the shell blowing was now closer, and out of my peripheral vision, I could see a soft orange glow. A mist began to surround us, and we were assaulted with the horrid stench of something rotten. My cousin screamed at me to get down. 
I knew I was supposed to take my clothes off, but there was no time for that. So I just dropped to the ground face down and I closed my eyes. My heart pounded in my chest as I waited there for what seemed like forever. I felt the warm air wash over me as the drumbeat was finally upon us. But I couldn't help it. Curiosity got the best of me and I peeked through my fingers. All I could see was the ground in front of me. I was enveloped by a swirling mist that glowed orange from the torches that the night marchers carried. I caught glimpses of legs walking right past me, but they didn't have feet. Against my better judgment, I looked up. I will never forget what I saw. They were apparitions, shadows of towering men dressed in traditional Hawaiian warrior garb, capes, and helmets. They were obscured by the orange glowing mist, so I couldn't make out their faces. They all carried torches in one hand, spears and other ancient weaponry in the other. But then the drumbeat stopped, and they halted, turning to look at me. I felt this weird floating sensation and everything began to spin like I had vertigo. I started to black out, but not before I heard a voice call out my name. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I woke up to the sound of my cousin yelling for me. The night marchers were gone and it was dark under a canopy of trees. I got up and I saw my cousin 20 feet away. I flagged him down, he gave me a big bear hug, he said he was afraid I was lost forever. I somehow ended up pretty far away from where we initially dropped face down. I had no recollection of what happened, other than the brief glimpses I caught when I stupidly looked up at the night marchers. My cousin and I went back to our campsite, waited for dawn, and then we packed up our things and we got out of there. We told our tutu what happened and she said I was very lucky. She confirmed that our family was descended from the Hawaiian warrior class and that an ancestor claimed me, saving my life. Strangely, that experience gave me a new sense of pride about my heritage. As a culture, Hawaiians revere the land, what we call the Aina, and there's a strong spiritual connection. The Aina deserves our respect, and if we don't give it, we may open ourselves up to a reckoning that we are not prepared for. My wife and I just returned home from what should have been a romantic weekend getaway to upstate New York. It was anything but. We were coming up on our third wedding anniversary, and as a gift, I decided to surprise her with a weekend trip to Lake George. Since it's not exactly tourist season, I got a good deal on a beautiful cabin for three nights. It was actually built on one of the small islands dotting the lake, and we would have to take a short boat ride to get to it. My wife was totally surprised, and after we tied up the boat to the small dock on the shore, we got to exploring. The island itself was small, a few hundred yards wide at best. The cabin was spacious, though, and it had an old rustic charm. Artwork of the lake and surrounding area lined the walls. We had gotten here just as it started to get dark, and after a quick dinner, we called it an early night. We were beat after the long car drive and boat ride. The next morning, I woke up early before my wife. I made a pot of coffee and I stepped outside. Enjoying the brisk air, I took a walk down to the shore to check on the boat and make sure it was still securely tied. And that's when I noticed something odd. The ground around the little dock was soggy from the constant lapping of the small gentle waves. Around the boat, there were strange footprints in the dirt. They weren't from a shoe. They were narrow and elongated what looked like a set of four thin toes jutted out from a shallow heel. No animal came to mind, but then again, I'm not much of a naturist. I chalked it up to some kind of local fauna that I wasn't familiar with, and I returned to the cabin to wake up my wife to have some breakfast and a day out on the lake. We took the boat out for a while. It wasn't particularly cold, so we stayed out a bit longer than we planned. When we returned to the cabin, we grilled some food and after dinner decided to have another cup of coffee and sit on the chair by the house. We both fell asleep. I'm not sure what it was that woke us up, but the first thing I noticed was that it had gotten much colder. I looked over at my wife in the light, I could see the tip of her nose was red. And as I went to shake her awake, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye, down towards the water. I felt a pang of panic. Somebody had come out onto the island, like this was going to cause us some trouble, maybe. But there wasn't any help that would get to us quickly. 
Our cell phones didn't even have service, and there was no landline. I shook my wife as I looked over her shoulder, trying to get a better look at whoever it was. And just as she was waking up, a gust of wind blew the branches overhead, causing an opening for the moonlight to shine down on the water's edge. What I saw shocked me. A pale, thin figure was crawling out of the water and onto the beach. It had two arms and legs that I could make out, and a head that was too large for its frail body. It didn't have any eyes as far as I could tell, and I could have sworn that I spotted a pair of gills along each side of its throat. My wife was waking up now, and I slapped my free hand over her mouth. Of course, this startled her, and I could see an angry flash in her eyes, but the look on my face quickly turned her irritation to concern. I nodded my head in the direction of the creature. She slowly turned to look, and I could feel her body go rigid when she saw it. The creature was roaming around now, slowly along the shore, seemingly aimless in its plodding. I whispered for my wife to follow me, and we quietly rose from the chair and began slowly stepping back towards the house. In an unfamiliar setting and with full attention on the creature, I accidentally bumped into the grill we had cooked on earlier. The metal spatula had been resting on top and it fell, clattering to the floor of the small paved patio that the grill was on. The clang sounded like a gunshot in the silent darkness, and the creature snapped its head in our direction. We both froze, waiting to see what would happen next. But almost immediately, the thing opened its mouth and let out a piercing scream, like a small child trying to scream while gargling. I grabbed my wife by the arm and I pulled her behind me, sprinting towards the house. I guess she had thrown a look over her shoulder as we ran because she was now screaming, It's coming! I didn't bother to look and instead dashed the last few feet, clinging to my wife. I threw open the door and tossed her inside, coming in just after and slamming the door shut behind me. The door was solid oak, and there were no windows on this wall, but there was a series of small raps at the door, followed by another squeal. We both stood frozen too afraid to make any noise or move. After a few minutes of silence, we heard one last scream, further away, thank God, from the direction of the shoreline, and then that was it. We spent a sleepless night huddled on the couch in complete terror, praying for the sun to rise, and as soon as it did, we grabbed our belongings and ran to the boat deck. We had the boat loaded and we pulled out into the lake in less than three minutes spent the whole ride back to the main shoreline waiting for a sickly hand to come over the side of the boat, but nothing ever materialized. We got back to the office and dropped the keys with the clerk not even explaining our early checkout. We didn't even ask for a refund. We have no idea what it was we saw that night, and frankly, I don't really want to know. I just want to share my experience with you and warn everybody else that there is something very inhuman living on or in Lake George. When I was with the Park Service in West Virginia, we used to host a scouts program. They spent a lot of hours on volunteer projects, and part of their service involved helping to restore parks throughout the county. Our area was a popular place for them to come and do trail maintenance and improve the campgrounds in many ways. Just clearing the area of trash and debris alone was a great service they provided. We were hosting a group like that about five years ago, and that's the year I got more than I bargained for. The age group was between 10 and 12 years old. It was their last camp of the year, and they were making the most of it. They had worked hard all day, and some of their junior assistant leaders put together a night game for them. It was meant to be a kind of spooky game where they could just let off steam after a hard days of work. It involved the kids completing some kind of task while the junior leaders tried to scare them. I was pretty new to the job then, so I didn't know if that was a common activity or not. It was a bit before Halloween, so I was guessing they were just getting into the spirit of the season. Myself and another ranger had given a talk earlier in the evening, and we were just kind of facilitating the gathering and making sure everybody stayed within the boundaries. Some of the assistants had to put on some monster masks and we were hiding out in the woods close to the checkpoints the scouts had to pass. I was going in between checkpoints, keeping an eye on things. There was an open stretch of forest near the upper boundary where I decided to hang out on this big rock so that no one would go too far. 
I had my flashlight off though, so I wouldn't mess up the game. But it was the kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes and you start imagining things that aren't there. I was sitting there and I thought I saw a shadow that was around my size running through the trees a few times. I couldn't see it very well, so I just assumed that I was imagining things because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. I had been there quite a while and it was getting kind of late. I was pretty sure the game would be over soon and everybody would go back to the fire to have s'mores. But then I saw the shadow again. This time I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it might be one of the assistants hiding to scare the kids. I decided to go over since it was about time to go back. I was still some distance away. But when I got closer, I aimed my flashlight toward the tree. There was definitely someone very tall standing there. But when my light hit its face, I was shocked to see reflective red eyes looking back at me. I started to feel dread. Something felt off. I started to ask if everything was okay, but then I saw that this thing had huge black wings that covered most of its body. My mind tried to rationalize it away. I tried to tell myself that it was just someone who had decided to use an elaborate costume, but I knew it wasn't true. This thing wasn't human. Besides the red eyes, it didn't seem to have any facial features, just darkness. Plus, it was taller than me by about a foot. It lifted up its wings and it made a god-awful piercing shriek, and it jumped straight into the tree behind it where it could look down on me. It was slowly turning its head back and forth like it was waiting for something else to come. Something inside me told me just to run. It didn't matter if it was just a stupid prank. I felt this unholy fear. If it wasn't a prank, I felt like I was in serious danger. I ran as fast as I could. I thought I heard it following me in the trees, but I couldn't take the time to look around. I arrived back at the campfire, and it looked like everybody else had already gotten back and was just milling around, laughing and joking. I went and found the other ranger there and told him what happened. He just looked weird at me, thinking I was making it up. He had been employed there longer than me. I felt like he was looking me up and down, like I was dumb, like a dumb whippersnapper who didn't know how to act in the woods. I just shut up after that, and I started to question my own sanity. Everybody else was just having a good time, but my adrenaline was really jumping. I just kept circling the camp and shining my light into the woods whenever I thought I heard anything. Eventually, the party died down, and everybody went back down the trail to their tents. I stayed by the fire a good long time, thinking I had chosen the completely wrong kind of work. The next day, I went back to that area to check it out, but I never found anything but endless trees. Well, I mean, I did find a big black bird carcass, but that could have been from anything. It's not like it was the first one of those I had ever seen. In spite of that creepy night, though, I did stay with the job even though I did end up leaving that area the next summer. I ended up with the city parks department in New York City. Now, there are some stories. Plenty of freaks up there, too. I'll tell you about it later. My family always longed to travel. When we were kids, we couldn't afford it. My mom, a single mom, would always talk to us and dream about all of the sites in the United States that she hadn't yet had the opportunity to see. We wanted to see those things, too. So once we siblings got older, we made a list of all the places our mom described and promised that we'd all make our way through the destinations, one at a time. We took her to a few of them. She enjoyed Crater Lake the most, but unfortunately, she didn't get around to the Grand Canyon until after she died. So let me explain. Once mom died, my siblings started to give up on the list. It wasn't the same without mom, they said. I felt the same as the rest of them, but I just wasn't ready to give up yet. The road trips across the country to check out the last remaining wonders of the USA became my way of staying close to her. I'd even talk to her on the road. I'd ask her what she thought of all my favorite views. When I finally made it to the Grand Canyon, it felt bittersweet. It was the last destination on my list, and my list represented my mom's bucket list, complete now thanks to my dedication. 
but it also meant that I'd have to find a new way to bond with mom. While there, I started to think about how I wasn't ready to say goodbye to these trips. So I booked an extra long stay in the area so that I could return to see the canyon one more time before heading home. The first day was exactly the wonder and spectacle that you would expect. You don't know how small you are until you're faced with the great scope of the earth. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing the canyon. I'm not good at that kind of thing. But what I do want to describe is what I saw on the second day. Dusk was approaching. The descending light framed the rocks and the sand beautifully. It was different than the broad daylight view that I had enjoyed on my first day. So I asked mom what she thought, and I waited for an answer. I never heard her voice, we don't talk that way. Usually I'd just get a feeling. That night I did receive the feeling that she was there, but it was interrupted by a light in the distance. I was alone at that particular overlook. I had purposely chosen a less crowded area to admire the canyon. The light demanded my attention, especially since it wasn't coming from the road in the distance or the town that I knew was further back. Red blinking lights began flickering near the bottom of the canyon. I thought perhaps there was a road down there. It was an emergency vehicle, maybe. Maybe I hadn't seen them descend into the canyon. The idea of somebody being rescued out of the bottom of the canyon guaranteed that I wouldn't be looking away. It was unexpected, magnetic, but it was not a vehicle at the bottom of the canyon. I know this because the longer I stared, the more I saw it. There was a large triangular shape visible on the canyon floor. The blinking red lights revealed more of it as time went on. Otherwise, its colors were obscured. It looked disguised in some way. It was as if the triangular body was colored exactly the same as the canyon around it. Now I wondered if it was a jet, some type of military craft, in disguise. No, it wasn't flying and I had no reason to assume it could be, but jets were the only vehicles I knew of that depended on such great stealth. And then the triangle began to levitate. As it rose from the ground, its canyon-colored veil seemed to disappear. Now it looked black. Black, metallic, and massive. I mean, it could have parked my car on its back and still had room to walk around. I watched as it climbed out of the canyon and continued to climb. I asked my mom if she was seeing the same thing. Again, there were no words, no feelings, but I felt confident that she was there with me. There's no way she would let me face this alone. Besides, someone would have to believe my story. I was already repeating how unbelievable this encounter was in my head at the time. The longest point of the triangle then turned and seemed to fixate on my position. The red strobe changed its pattern, and now I'm wondering if it was trying to communicate. I've tried to learn Morse code ever since that night, but I can't perfectly recall the way the lights were blinking. I only remember feeling glued to it. I was like a moth being pulled to a flame. This craft and I stared at each other. It seemed to be waiting for something. I can't explain it, but I suddenly felt my mom more strongly than before. It didn't just seem like the craft was observing me. It felt like she was looking down from somewhere up above. Imagining her in that ship instead of somewhere in heaven made me smile. She would have had some great views from inside that thing. And then the vehicle dashed into the night, tore towards the clouds at a blistering speed. Didn't make any sound, either. The next day I asked around, there were a few reports of strange shapes in the sky. I wasn't the only person with their eyes watching the Grand Canyon, after all. What I want to know was, why did I feel the way I did? Why did I feel like she was there with me? Has anybody ever talked about that before? Was it something genuine? Was I in shock? Was it even real? I want to know the theories, and I want to know if I should go back looking for it again. I'm sure you've heard that we all have a doppelganger somewhere in the world. That's something that has been told to me personally at least a dozen times in my life. It's always said by someone who seems to have a little bit of scientific basis for the claim 
but has never presented it as a fact with any kind of proof. You've probably also heard from people who claim to have met their doppelganger, or maybe you've even seen yours. So with that in mind, what I'm about to tell you will probably seem underwhelming at first, but I promise this was more than a doppelganger. This was some cross-dimension weirdness that I have never been able to wrap my head around. In August of 1996, I was a 10-year-old kid with a 13-year-old brother and a 6-year-old sister. Our dad had died earlier in the summer in a car accident. He'd been on his way to the store for my mom, who had forgotten to buy milk during the weekly grocery trip that morning. Mom had a really hard time with it, not only with losing dad, but also blaming herself for having to send him back, even though it wasn't her fault at all. As a result of blaming herself, she had slipped into a depression, a funk. My older brother had been doing most of the parenting for the last few months, even though he was barely a teenager. So we were a very different family than we had been just months earlier. At the time of Dad's death, we had been planning a family trip to Disney World. Mom was committed to taking us still, even in her emotional state because it was something Dad had been looking forward to, and she'd promised us kids. So in August, as planned, we got in the car and took the drive down to Orlando from Atlanta, where we lived. It would be about a six and a half or seven hour drive. The day we got to Disney started out seemingly normal for a day there. We went on rides, saw the sights, and just generally enjoyed ourselves as much as we could. It wasn't until the haunted house ride that things started to get strange. That ride is surprisingly sentimental. After watching the ghosts, who were still in love and dancing through the walls with the loves of their lives, Mom needed a moment to herself. So she took a seat at a food station and sent me, my brother, and our sister to meet Minnie Mouse, who was scheduled to make an appearance shortly at one of the photo tents. We were waiting in line when suddenly we heard somebody call our names. A male voice. It sounded just like Dad. We turned and we looked, and there he was. Our dad frantically scanning the crowd for us. We all froze. We didn't know what we were looking at, but we knew we could all see it and that we weren't just imagining it. I whispered to my brother, is that dad? And he just shook his head and said, it can't be. But it was. He saw us and he started walking towards us. My little sister ran over and jumped up into his arms, crying and hugging him. He was comforting her, saying it was okay that he knows it's scary to get lost, but he was right there the whole time. I looked at my brother and he looked at me. We both knew that something very weird and potentially dangerous was going on. My brother ran over and grabbed my sister out of the dad lookalike's arms. I ran with him and then we all took off as fast as we could back to where we had left mom. The guy took after us, chasing us the whole way. When we got to mom, she stood up and in a hurry asked what we were so scared of. She could see it on our faces. My sister was crying, beating on my brother's back the whole time he ran with her, screaming for him to let her down because she wanted to see daddy. So when we got to mom and my sister was screaming, I want daddy, over and over, mom thought that the haunted house had bothered her too. She took my sister in her arms and was saying, daddy's in heaven, but he can still see us though. She was trying to comfort her and calm her down, but it wasn't working. My sister pulled back away from my mom and then said, Daddy's right there, and pointed back into the crowd. Mom looked. She saw him too. The man that looked like Dad was standing there staring at Mom, with his face as white as a sheet. And then he was shaking and starting to cry. Mom looked at him with the exact same expression. She said, Eric. The man looked and said, Laura. Both of the names were right. And then at the exact same time, they both shook their heads and said, You died when you went to get the milk. That's when three kids who looked just like me and my siblings came running through the crowd, yelling for their dad. He turned and saw them and gave us one last glance before he took off, grabbed them, leading them away before they saw us too. We didn't stay long at Disney after that. Mom hurried us out and we went to the beach and then SeaWorld for the rest of the day. And we never really talked about what happened that day until earlier this year, after cancer took Mom away. We were all older now. 
My brother, sister, and I started talking about the Disney run-in the day after Mom's funeral. We all had different ideas about what it could have been. My brother thinks it's just a wild coincidence that some people who looked very similar to our family and had at least a few of the same names and circumstances happened to have been there at the same time. Well, that's ridiculous. That's impossible. My little sister thinks it was a ghost and that the doubles of us were something that we just imagined in order to make sense of what had happened over the years. Personally, I believe that somehow we crossed dimensional paths with ourselves, our own family, living in mom's alternate world of what if? What if she had gone for the milk that day instead of dad? What if she had never felt the need to blame herself for what happened? I guess we'll never know for sure. But I do know this, what we saw was very real, and it has affected me every single day since. There's an entire city floating on the Caspian Sea. It's sinking, but it's there. 300 kilometers of bridges, roadways, complexes, and oil rigs. I worked there for four years. It was a perilous and thankless job. Most of the world doesn't know that oil rocks exists. The money I made was good, though. It kept me out of trouble for a while, too. Unfortunately for me and every poor soul working these rigs, trouble came to oil rocks. It came for us, and we couldn't escape it. Out there, trouble rolled in like the fog. The first guy disappeared a year and a half in. He vanished off the side of the rig. No splash. No nothing. The ocean has a way of swallowing you whole, I guess. It's swallowing the whole city. Regardless, we should have known something was up then. They kept his disappearance quiet, the higher-ups. When we asked to review the security footage from the area he was working, they outright refused. Red flag, right? The thing about red flags is they're still so easy to ignore. It isn't red or green or any color at all if you decide to just look the other way. And sometimes it even takes time. Well, that's what we did. Look the other way. We looked away and we went on with our lives, working in the middle of the Caspian Sea. After that disappearance, we had a few more months of peace. Then, we only had trouble. I wish I could say I had seen it first. I didn't. I did hear it, though. One night, the whole ocean sounded like it was croaking. It sounded like a sea of frogs. None of us could see anything in the dark water, but the company assured us that it was just the sound of migrating whales. Now, I've heard whales before. I've seen and studied whales. Those sounds were not coming from any whale that lives in our sea. It came back a couple of nights later, and this time there was a splash because we heard another man hit the water. At least we knew where to look. We got a flotation device in his arms, and we were hoisting him up in no time. A few blankets later, and the guy was right as rain, toasty and chatting us up. Escaping death is pretty exciting, I guess. He said somebody pushed him. He knew he'd been alone in the area and every other guy was accounted for. Nobody living on oil rocks could have reached him, let alone thrown him over the railing. We mandated a buddy system after that. But Trouble didn't care about our buddy system. It came for us in twos. Two guys that I started with were the next to encounter the croaking thing from the Caspian Sea. They were attacked. Maimed would be a better description. The company had to bury their injuries under the guise of an equipment malfunction. We work with some heavy machinery, but nothing that could cut you like that guy got cut. It was ugly. They lived, as far as I know. Over the course of the next three weeks, more and more of us started to see it. My buddy described it as a man with a head of seaweed for hair. Others said it looked like an alien. I saw it one time, just the once, as it slipped off the rig and fell into the ocean. It's hard to describe, I guess. There's nothing to compare it to in a way that feels justified. It had arms like a man, and it had legs like a man. I thought I saw hands, webbed fingers, coming out of all four of those limbs. Its skin was thick and warty like a toad or a frog. I forget which one. Its stomach was bulbous and fat. Its eyes were wide-set, large, and red. It turns my stomach just to think about that face. 
and it hurts to think about the long mouth and the rows of needlepoint teeth. It wasn't a whale, I'll tell you that much. It was a nightmare. I spotted it as it fled another point of attack. It had come for one of the ladies working at Oil Rocks. She was smarter than the rest of us, apparently, because she picked up a wrench and taught that thing a lesson. She was covered then in a mucus-like blood that certainly was not hers. And that was when the Iranians showed up. Government types. They only gave their credentials to our superiors. The rest of us just did what they said. Quarantine. Some of us were sent home, myself included. The lady covered in that mucus was hauled back to the mainland. I don't know what became of her, and I never wanted to ask. The last thing that she had said to any of us was, It's starting to burn. Can you imagine that? Being covered in the blood of something that tried to kill you, and the slime is starting to give you a rash? The way she said it, I'll never forget. Starting to burn. Starting. She was scratching and patting at her skin like smoke was coming off of it. And then, they took her away. So, if the burning was only starting, what came next? Did they take her to a hospital or a lab? I guess I'm just lucky that I wasn't with her. Over those next few weeks, we were forced to accept a very hard truth. Out there on oil rocks, we fancied ourselves the smartest things around. We went looking for privacy, thinking we could demand it from nature. Nature had a different plan for us. Nature taught us that no matter how many bridges we build or how many rigs we stab into the earth, we are not the masters of the ocean or the land. We weren't even safe on the structures that we built. At any point in time, something can rush up from the dark and drag us back into the depths. Hi, my name is Roy, and I have a story to tell you from my childhood. I grew up with an older brother. At the time this happened, I was seven and he was nine. We used to play all the time in the spring and summer in a very large patch of woods directly behind our house. We spent hours and hours back there playing, playing swords with sticks, building tree forts, pretending to start fires, cops and robbers, you name it. We spent hours exploring, looking at bugs, trying to find buried treasure like any kids do. All the good stuff. We tried to spend the majority of our free time outside when we could, mainly because inside offered us no entertainment. My parents didn't have a TV, no game systems, nothing. We had a few books here and there, but nothing my brother and I were interested in, so we would try to spend all of our time outside and live like real kids do. But that changed halfway during a summer when I was seven and he was nine. We were playing outside. I remember we had a game of hide and seek going. Well, I was it, and so I counted to 50. This time, before I could even finish counting though, he comes running back, screaming all the way back to the house. It completely caught me off guard, totally by surprise. Then I thought he was pranking me or trying to joke with me. So I laughed and I ran after him but he was just bawling hysterically, crying and screaming and running to the back door. I chased after him and tried to get him to slow down, but he didn't. He didn't even acknowledge me. He was in a total state of shock and fear. When he got to the back door, I finally caught up with him. My mom was busy doing something inside, so it took her a minute, if not more, to get to the back door. She usually kept it locked. I had never seen my brother in my life so overtaken by pure, raw emotion as that fear that he had. It wasn't until a little later, even my mom was freaked out, that she was able to get him to calm down. But it was days before he would tell any of us exactly what happened. He just said that he saw something, but we really couldn't get anything out of him. And then days after that, he told me what it was. It was about a week later, and he asked me if I could keep a secret. I said yes. Even more so, being only seven years old, you want to do anything to stand by your older brother. He told me that he saw a real werewolf, and that he was running to hide. He was walking up to him from behind a tree, reaching out to grab him. That's what he said. He said it was big and hairy, covered in dark black fur with huge fangs and large eyes and ears. It scared him so bad that he ran. 
He was pretty serious about it too. He was very shaken up. Retelling the story at nine years old wasn't easy. Plus, he had no desire to go back into the woods for the rest of the year, which was a huge loss for both of us. We just stayed inside and we were bored the rest of the summer. Now that we're both in our late 20s, I ask him about it sometimes. He basically just tells me what I've told you already, that he believes he saw some sort of a creature that resembled a werewolf. He's pretty firm in his belief that vampires, mummies, werewolves don't exist, but there are animals out there that have some resemblance to them. I mean, that's a lot more plausible than the idea of an actual werewolf existing. But even now, he describes it to a T, basically says exactly what he did when he was nine. It stood up on two legs, was covered in dark black fur that was really thick, kind of like a shaggy dog, long, gangly, very unkempt, like it had been rolling around in dirt and filth and muck. He said its face was somewhere of a cross between a German shepherd and a wolf, a very pronounced brow ridge like some monkeys have, and very, very long ears that were very pointed, and a long muzzle, and huge, sharp canines. This thing was walking towards him, extending both of its arms like it was going to grab him, but it made no effort to run after him, or move any faster than at a casual slow pace, even after my brother started running. The whole thing is weird, he says, but it is what it is. The following spring and summer, we continued to play back in those woods, and we never had any problems afterwards. We then moved out of that house and all the way across town when we were 15 and 13. That's my story, or should I say, my brother's story. I never saw or heard anything. I live outside the incredibly small town of Weaverville in Northern California. Basically, I live in the sticks. I believe I saw something, some kind of animal, some creature that I'm not quite sure what it is. I can't explain it, but the only description I can give you is that it resembled that of a Great Dane, except standing on two legs. The only connection I have is when I grew up, I was very close to my aunt. She always had two Great Danes with her. My entire upbringing, anytime one would die, she would get another. It was very odd, so that has always stuck with me. What I saw that night closely resembled that exactly of a Great Dane. In fact, I even suspected it was one at first and was wondering how weird it was that it was walking around. But on closer inspection, even though it was as large and as tall and lanky, it resembled more of a coyote from what I could tell. Very, very slender. Its legs were a little more muscular than that of a dog's, but still it had the hocks and everything. It stared at me from the wood line, glowing red orbs for eyes, but not like monster red. They were just a warm red glow, but an unnatural glow, if anything. I wasn't really afraid as much as I was confused. It seemed to be watching me very nervously, like it had gotten caught doing something and was waiting for me to leave. I don't know. It doesn't really make sense, but that's the vibe I got from it. At the time, I was in my backyard splitting firewood when I happened to look up and see this thing staring at me. My backyard isn't the largest, but those trees do go on for quite a while. I want to say another five, six miles. I could be way off, but I know it's a ways back. I've only seen this animal once. This was about three months ago, right at the height of summer. I've never seen it since, nor heard of it, and I've no idea what it could be. From what I know, it could possibly be some sort of a rabid wild dog, although I've never heard of rabid wild dogs around here, and by themselves, and especially ones that look like Coyote Great Danes. This occurred many, many moons ago, when I was a young boy with my father on a hunting trip up in Alaska. For a long time, I never believed in creatures until this particular hunting trip with my father. When I saw, with my own eyes, my father too, a creature rip out the throat of an adult male grizzly bear. We saw it through my dad's rifle scope. Now I'm older and time has passed and I've had time to process what kind of animal I saw. There's no doubt in my mind 
that this was a full-on battle between the alphas of the woods. My father wasn't intentionally hunting bear. We were just up on a high perch and my dad was scoping around with his binoculars. After looking about 300 yards out, give or take, he spotted something incredibly large which turned out to be a male adult grizzly bear. He told me, son, take a look at this, and he handed me the rifle with the scope. As he continued to look through binoculars, I looked in the direction he pointed and I could see that something even larger was coming upon the grizzly bear. My dad, who appeared just as shocked as I was, didn't know what animal could be bigger than a grizzly and what this large, dark shape descending upon the bear from behind could be. We both watched in horror as this thing moved quickly and jumped on the back of the grizzly bear. We then took turns looking through the scope. It appeared to be a giant wolf that looked very human-like. It then reached around and grabbed the bear by the throat, dug in and ripped it apart in one fluid motion, silently. My dad started hollering and freaking out since he was unsure what we were witnessing or what this thing could be. He said, son, I've never seen a wolf do that or get that big. I didn't realize Alaska had these kinds of wolves up here. What we witnessed that day was like watching a trained assassin sneak up on an innocent victim and execute a kill perfectly without any hesitation, without any struggle. And to do that to an adult male grizzly bear? If you know anything about grizzly bears, they are huge, massive killing machines. You don't want to cross a grizzly. After this wolf thing killed the grizzly bear, that was it. There was no eating it, it just left it, deserted it, quickly, fast. We didn't even see where it went, it was like a blur, it was just gone. My father was more shocked than anything, and because I was so young and naive, I wasn't quite fully processing and understanding what we had seen. But my dad just kept telling me over and over, son, I had no idea there were wolves like that up here that got that big or that fast. And there was something different about that wolf, he told me, something he couldn't explain. I almost wonder if he was afraid to truly tell me and to go into the details of what he really thought it was. He didn't want to scare me being a young boy. That's what I think. There isn't much else to the story. It was basically a quick kill. The grizzly bear didn't even have time to react to what was going on. It was amazing. And this thing, had we not been paying attention, we would have never even heard it make a noise. That's the one thing that scares me. It was completely silent. Never made a noise from moving to the bear to moving outside of the area, even when it killed it. It was the perfect assassin right before our very eyes. Something my father and I still talk about to this day. I was just a normal person living a normal life until one day the government came for me. They said that I had been selected for a special program and that I was going to be part of a scientific study that could change the world. They said I was an exact match for what they were looking for. I was excited because actually I had volunteered for the program. How I heard about it is a story for another day. They promised me that I would be well taken care of and reassured me that I would be helping to find the cure, not to mention the sizable monetary stipend that I would receive when it concluded. Little did I know that this would be the worst decision of my life. First came the paperwork, signing off on pages and pages that made me second guess what I was getting myself into. And then a few weeks later, I was picked up and taken to a well-hidden and probably top-secret facility deep in the woods. Riding there in the limo with the blacked-out windows should have been a red flag, but at the time, it made me feel special. But getting out of the limo felt like a different story. Here was where the rigorous poking and prodding began, and that wasn't even the study. That was just to check one last time that I was 100% compatible. I was eventually told that I was accepted, but would now have to sign off on staying at the facility. No leaving, no contacting anybody outside for the duration of the study, which was slated to take three months. I was deep into it at this point, so I agreed. The experiments began, and at first they seemed harmless enough, but as time went on they became more and more extreme. 
I was subjected to a series of genetic manipulations and treatments that made me uncomfortable. And soon I started to notice changes in my body, changes that were not at all what I was expecting. But they told me not to worry. But how couldn't I? My senses became heightened, my strength and speed increased, and I began to develop thick, coarse hair all over my body. I also started to experience strange urges, like the need to run outdoors, and even stranger still, a craving for raw meat. I knew something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. I tried talking to the doctors, if they even were real doctors, now I wasn't sure, but I couldn't get anybody to listen or react. There was a lot of hush-hush talking that went on between them, and often they had concerned looks on their faces. I then asked to leave the facility so that I could find help on my own, but I wasn't allowed to leave, and it was pointed out to me that I had signed the papers that agreed to that rule. I couldn't seek help, and my mind was starting to lose it. Now I won't reveal how, but one day, I tried to escape. Let's just say it was somebody from the inside that seemed to be just as worried and as scared as me. However, I didn't get far out of the building before they were upon me, and restraining me, and pulling me back inside. I was thrown into a locked room and kept away from all other patients, almost like solitary, I would say. The next morning, three of the white coats came into the room. Two held me while the third injected me with a series of shots. Each shot burned more than the last. I started to sweat and to feel faint. I was fading fast and I was barely able to watch them leave, but I did hear one of them say, werewolf, and they left. The next few days were excruciating as my body felt like it was on fire. I could barely sit up, let alone stand. The pain was so intense that eventually I passed out completely. I have no idea how much time passed after that, but the next thing I knew... I was waking up back at home, in my bed. You can only imagine how that scared the you-know-what out of me. The questions in my head were endless, not the least of which was, how did I get back here? And would they be coming back for me? I never imagined that my participation in a scientific study would lead to this. I feel betrayed and used by the government, if that's who they even were. And I can't help but wonder how many other innocent people are going through the same thing. People like me, people who were available to give themselves to this. It's a nightmare that I can never wake up from. But those people are much, much more power than me in that building. So I'm just moving forward with my life, trying to forget it all. Oh yeah, and by the way, my body seems to be mostly returned to normal, although... The hair on my arms and legs continues to grow dark and thick, but not in a furry animal kind of a way, so I'm just living with it for now. Have you ever seen a man change color? Well, maybe that isn't the right way to ask the question. I guess these days tattoos and tans and medical treatments can do all that. But what I meant to ask was, has somebody ever changed color right before your eyes. I'm guessing probably not unless you've seen the same things that I have. Let me tell you though, I haven't met a person yet who has seen what I've seen. But I'd like to know that I didn't dream it up. I'd like to know that I've been right all along and not crazy like the rest of the world wants me to believe. My work has led me to a lot of places. You'll need to know why I was out in the middle of nowhere if you're going to believe the rest of this. I'm a contractor. I specialize in flooring installation. Carpet, wood, concrete. If you walk on it, I put it down. Everyone needs floors, you see. Even the government. Even in places they don't want many people to be walking. That's enough of the spooky, ominous meandering. To tell you the truth, I was excited to take the job. They were hiring a crew to lay down a new floor in a New Mexico aircraft hangar. Pay was extraordinary. It wiped out all of my debts, as a matter of fact. What I saw there, however, certainly wasn't covered in the job description. There were long stretches of time when my crew was monitored by a single guard. 
We were working overnights, long hours to get the hangar up and running as soon as possible. The government must not have seen the point in assigning a whole team of personnel to babysitting duty. Maybe they were nearby working on something else. There were certainly other things nearby. So two nights before our deadline hit, we saw them. The hangar's open side was facing the desert. Any other night, it was like staring into an abyss. When we were lucky, we would see the faint shimmer of a star. Fortunately for us, we hadn't taken the job for the view... Aside from the occasional smoke break, we didn't even step foot outside. This night, those smoke breaks were nearly the death of us. Shane went out to take the first break and came back yelling. He said he saw something walking out there. The guard instructed us to stay put to get back to work, while he took his flashlight to check the perimeter. He came back empty-handed and warned Shane that one more outburst would get us all canned. Shane kept quiet after that. The guard, however, did not. Seemingly at random, just an hour or two later, he snapped his flashlight back on and broke into a sprint. He was running straight into the desert. There was no explanation. A few of us dropped our tools and watched, but none of us called out, especially not Shane. We watched his bobbing flashlight until we got so far that even it faded into the night. There's no chance we went back to working. Not after that. Instead, we approached the open doorway. We swung a few of our spotlights around to get a better look at the landscape. It didn't help. We still didn't call out, though, but we were watching for any signs of our government-approved babysitter. And after about 15 minutes passed, we started to chatter. We asked Shane to describe what he saw again. He said he saw a man. He said, a naked man walking with a hunched back and hanging limbs. One of us remarked that we were dealing with a zombie. I don't remember who said it, but honestly, a zombie would have been easier. A few minutes later, and Shane spoke again. This time he pointed for our eyes to follow, and our gazes all landed on the silhouette of the guard. He was finally lumbering back to the hangar. His back was hunched. His arms were hanging. As his silhouette entered the glow of the spotlight, I noticed something weird. I don't know how many of the other guys saw it. We didn't ask or say anything after the job was over. The details of his uniform, the button breast pocket, and the name tag were sliding into place. It was as if his attire was being sculpted out of clay. By the time the light was fully on him, he looked the same as before. But I knew what I saw, and Shane recognized his gait. Shane lifted the floor scraper, like a broom with a flat metal head, and he held it out like a spear. He shouted for the guard to stay back. To everyone's surprise, the guard did exactly that. The thing knew it was caught, I realized. It knew that it was caught and it wasn't looking for a fight. And then with the rest of us watching, it changed. Its skin and wardrobe slipped and shimmered like cement being mixed in a bucket. It changed color, too, every part of it. The light hue of its skin and the dark hue of its uniform faded to the same beige as the sand beneath its feet. It was blending into the desert, camouflaging itself like a chameleon. The process didn't last more than a few minutes, and then it vanished right before our eyes. We tried to watch for footprints in the dirt. There weren't any, not after it disappeared or before. It didn't feel real at the time, It doesn't feel real now, honestly. I guess that's why we went back to work. We resumed the night as usual, although our eyes kept jumping to the door, to the night, to the space in the distance where the shape of the guard had first returned. Whatever it was, it didn't come back, and we finished the job early. Our employers were glad to hear us insist that we didn't see anything that night. They wanted to forget it as much as we did and they didn't want word to get out. If it wasn't for this one thought, I guess the encounter would be pushed from my mind entirely. But if it did want to come back, how would I know where it was? How would I know who it was? Hi Lilith, my name is Carl, and I'm a logger living out in Seward, Alaska, part of the Kenai Peninsula. I'm in my 40s now, and I've moved up here in my late 20s after bouncing around a bunch in big cities in the U.S. 
Like a lot of people living here, I came to Alaska for some peace and quiet. The nature was a huge draw for me. I also like the ability to be self-sufficient. I have a boat docked in the harbor that I take out pretty regularly when I'm not on a job somewhere. Depending on the season and what I'm looking for, I might check out some inlets for waterfowl, go moose hunting, or go fishing. I grew up freshwater fishing, but ever since moving to Seward, I love sea fishing. I live with my wife Janet and our two kids, both of whom are in high school. Every March, the fishing season opens, and I spend a few months bringing in fish whenever I can to stock our freezer. Mine and Janet's favorite is halibut. Halibut is a huge flatfish, and the daily limits are two per person. So sometimes Janet or my older son Christopher will go out with me in the boat. A few years ago, in 2009, I had just finished up a job with my company further north and inland. I was itching to get out on the water, and after settling in at home for about a week, I decided to take the boat out with Janet. It was also sort of a date night for us, since I'd been away for almost a month. We took the boat out very early, just as dawn was starting, and headed southwest to some more open water, but not too far off the shoreline since halibut are bottom feeders. We had some frozen salmon heads and squid left over from last season defrosting in a bucket, and Janet and I were setting up the poles and the gear. Fishing's a great sport, but can be dangerous, especially in Alaska's waters. The temperatures even in April are freezing, and you can get hypothermia quickly. Not a situation you want to get into if it's just two of you out in a remote area in a boat. As we were setting up, I was letting the boat drift maybe 500 or so feet from the shore. We were just off the coast from Fort McGilvery, a landmark in a heavy wooded area that creates a little point into the bay. I had just stuck my hand into the bucket to check on the salmon heads and squid when Janet said something and pointed towards the shore. When I looked up, I could see a dark shape moving along the beach area. At first, I assumed it was a bear, since they like to comb the beaches. But it also could have been a moose, or a deer, or even a hunter, although I doubted that. I got a little excited, but could tell that something was strange with Janet. She was sitting stiffly and staring at the shore. When I asked what was up, she said that something just didn't look right. It was about 5 a.m. now, and we were ready to fish, but she seemed pretty bothered. I offered to drive the boat closer so we could see what it was. She was resistant at first, but hesitantly agreed. She gripped the edge of the boat tightly, and we sped toward the fort and the beach. Meanwhile, as soon as I started up the motor, the creature on the beach turned our way and was checking us out. I expected it to run off as we got closer, but it didn't. That put me on edge as I was now thinking it was a bear that was too used to humans. These bears can be dangerous and eventually end up trying to break into cabins or getting too close to people in very aggressive ways. So we got to about 200 feet off the shore and I pulled a pair of game binoculars out of my coat. It took a second to get situated, but I got the creature in my sights and realized it wasn't a bear at all. By now it was trying to move into the wooded area off the beach. As I watched, holding my breath, it moved on two feet not like a bear, but like a stiff human. Janet then hit my arm and told me she wanted to go back. Hold on, I said. I wanted to get a better look. I didn't dare bring the boat in closer since the water was very shallow here, but I kept my eyes glued to the bipedal creature. It wove in and out of the trees, poking out every few seconds to look back at us. The trees obscured it a bit, but I was able to see longer, shaggy hair on its body matted in some places. It was a dark, almost black-brown color, and had long arms that reached down past where I would say the knees were. I asked Janet if she wanted to look, but she shook her head and asked again if we could please just head back. In fact, she demanded it. So we switched spots so I could keep looking at the creature while she directed us back out to the fishing spot. As our boat moved away from the shore, the thing came out onto the beach a little further, but not like it had been before. It was a bumpy ride on the water, but I could see that it was beachcombing and would occasionally bend down, again with these stiff knees. When we were far out from the fort, Janet and I started fishing, and we just didn't talk about it until I brought it up about an hour later. I asked if she wanted to know what it was. She said no at first, but then gave in to her curiosity. Plus, we couldn't see the creature on the beach anymore. 
explained that it almost looked like a man in a black and brown ghillie suit, but one who was walking strangely. She looked at me and said that she had noticed that too, that the movements weren't fluid like a human, but they were very straightforward, more animal-like. We tried to focus on fishing, but after an hour, only caught one smaller halibut. So she and I decided to head back in. Since that day, we haven't seen anything like the creature again, but I've brought it up over beers in the bar, and I've heard similar stories from other people. Locals in the area seem pretty comfortable with the idea of Bigfoot or something ape-like roaming around. I'm thinking that's what we must have seen. Whatever it was, I didn't get a feeling of menace or aggression about it, more that it wanted to be left alone and just stay unseen. Eventually, Janet admitted that she had heard these stories too, and she'd even heard them growing up, but we never believed that such things existed until we saw it for ourselves. I don't really remember much, but I'll try to give you as many details as possible. It was just such a surreal experience that I second-guessed myself on almost everything. At this point, I've probably gone over it a million times in my head, trying to figure out if I even believe myself. I've decided that I do believe what happened, and that's why I'm passing my story on to you. I guess here's why I think that it's actually real. I don't drink, I don't do drugs, and I don't watch scary movies even. I have a strong mind and I trust my senses. And for that reason, I really do think that what I saw was real. But it's hard to not second guess yourself when you experience something so out of the ordinary. So my wife and I were driving back from the movies. It was really late because we had gone to the drive-in. They don't start until the sun sets and we had also stayed for the second movie, the double feature. So since we did that, we weren't on our way back home until after midnight. Also. The drive-in theater was about an hour from our house, so it was going to be very late by the time we got home. Most of the drive was on the highway, but there were some back roads once we got closer to home. And they were truly back roads through dark woods. There were no street lights, no house lights, not even light from the night sky. It was overcast, and the only real light was from our headlights. That, I believe, is why the other light stood out so clearly. It has stood out the most in my mind as I have gone over the details of the encounter over and over in my head. We didn't see the light head on. I actually noticed it in my rearview mirror. It was weird to see in the rearview mirror because the light was red. So I knew right away that it wasn't like the headlights of another car coming on us. It was red and fairly small. And it also seemed very, very stationary. It sat in the lower right-hand corner of my mirror and didn't really move at all. The light was visible in the mirror for probably two minutes. We were just driving along and it stayed in that lower corner that whole time. But then when we went around a bend in the road, the light suddenly disappeared momentarily. I wondered if maybe it was an emergency vehicle or some other vehicle out of the ordinary, but we just couldn't hear the siren. But then when we were back on the straight section of road, the light appeared again in the mirror, and this time it was bigger, which made me instantly think that whatever the light belonged to was now closer to us. I thought it was all a little weird, but not scary yet. But it started to get scary very quickly after that. Over the course of just a few seconds, the light began to grow noticeably bigger, still in the rearview mirror. It was illuminating the warning notification that was now popping up on my mirrors, which was beginning to make me very uneasy. You know, that objects in mirror are closer than they appear message. The red orb was gaining on us quickly until suddenly it seemed like it was right behind us. I could now see its glow casting shadows on my dashboard. My heart was hammering at this point. I wanted to speed up and drive away as fast as possible, but the road was windy and I was afraid of getting off in a ditch in the dark. Obviously, my wife was seeing all of this too, and she was also freaking out. The thought of a carjacking entered both of our heads. She was begging me to go faster, which I was trying my best to without losing control in the dark roads. She was clutching my arm in fear so hard that it hurt. I dared to quickly turn around to get a better view of it, and I could see it. The red orb was right behind us, 
probably only 10 feet from our bumper. And that's where my memory of the whole thing stops. The next thing I knew, my wife and I were sitting in our car, but we were pulled over and parked on the side of the road. We were both upright in our seats with our seat belts on. I had both hands on the steering wheel. And the strangest thing of all, the sun was rising. I don't know what happened, but I do know that I was absolutely terrified, and so was my wife. I remember her screaming my name, begging me to drive faster. I remember how tightly I was gripping the steering wheel. I remember how I could barely keep my eyes on the road ahead of me, trying to watch whatever awful thing was coming up behind me in the rearview mirror. And then, nothing, until we were parked, looking at the sun. My wife suggested maybe we drove through some strange chemical field, maybe let off by a local farmer, but of course that didn't really seem plausible. But our minds were trying to come up with anything. We were so tired that we decided we couldn't drive all the way home and had pulled over to sleep. No, that didn't make sense for so many reasons, including how could we have both had the same dream? And who sleeps with their seatbelt on gripping the steering wheel? No, that explanation doesn't make any sense to me. I think that something happened that we don't remember. That whoever or whatever the red orb was, it was trying to catch us or overtake us. And I think it did catch us, and something happened that we don't remember. And that's really scary. Like I said, I've questioned this experience a lot. I've tried to figure out any logical explanation, but I can't. There's just no way my wife and I had the exact same dream. So this is my first time writing it all down. Up until this point, I've just thought about it and talked about it with my wife. But now that I'm writing it down, it really seems extra real. And I'm 100% sure that something strange and unnatural, supernatural even, happened to us that night. I had always reminded my daughter, Ashley, to be cautious when we would head out on family camping trips, especially when her young son, Jimmy, my grandson, came along. He was only four years old on our most recent trip. That was me, Ashley, her husband, Jimmy, and my dad, five of us. Originally, going camping was how we coped with the passing of my husband, which happened before Jimmy was born and it just continued as a family tradition. We went to the same camping spot every time, a tucked away campsite with access to a creek and a small waterfall. My husband had called this spot his real home. We'd spent lots of time there over the years, even before we had been married. Every time we went, my husband brought along a small dream catcher that he insisted would keep bad spirits away. I sort of laughed it off, thinking he was just being superstitious, but I didn't mind. Whatever made him happy made me happy. He loved and believed in that dream catcher so much that I even had it buried with him. My dad loved to take Jimmy down to the creek to play in the water, the same as he had done with Ashley. This trip was no different. The day we arrived at the campsite, the first thing he did was take Jimmy down to the water. While I was unpacking, I could hear Jimmy laughing and splashing in the water. I could hear him talk about all the little fish he could see. He was even counting them and laughing when they would jump up to greet him. I loved listening to it and kept thinking about how much my husband would have loved to have known him. And then just as I opened and laid out the last sleeping bag, Ashley and her husband walked over. They had to head back to town. The drive into town was about half an hour, but they would also have to walk on foot about 20 minutes back up to where we had parked. They realized they had completely forgot Jimmy's pull-ups for playing in the creek. I'll keep an eye on them. I told them, smiling in the direction of the boys in the creek. My dad was stooped over a bit. He was getting a little old for these trips, but I knew he wouldn't miss it for the world. So Ashley and her husband took off in the direction of the car and left me standing there, setting up the grill, as I listened to my dad and his great-grandson enjoying the great outdoors. I pulled some fish from the cooler and began prepping the grill. I knew they would come back hungry, and I wanted to be sure that lunch would be ready. The grill was positioned so that I had my back to Dad and Jimmy. I was confident that they'd be fine without my eyes watching them the entire time. I mean, my dad, after all, was an adult. As the fire in the grill crackled louder, however, Jimmy's laughter seemed to sound further and further away. 
So I turned back around and I looked down towards the creek. Nobody was there. I thought they must have moved upstream a bit, but before putting the fish on, I figured I should go check. I decided to give them a shout and let them know that lunch was going to be ready in a bit. I headed down the embankment and instantly noticed something odd. My dad was sitting on the edge of the water with his head down and his eyes closed. Jimmy was nowhere in sight. Dad, I yelled, running down to him. He was startled but acted like nothing had happened. Oh, boy, I just had to close my eyes. The heat was really getting to me. And then he looked up. Where's Jimmy? I began to panic. Where was Jimmy? I shouted Jimmy's name, and I ran up and down the creek, but there was no response. I told my dad to head back up to the camp and sit and wait for Ashley. I had to start searching. I walked up the creek and then back on the other side. I looked at the ground for anything that might tell me what had happened, but nothing. I kept yelling Jimmy's name with no response. My grandson had disappeared into thin air. After two hours of searching, my daughter returned to find my dad sitting in the camp chair waiting for her. He told her Jimmy was missing and that I was out looking for him. She immediately ran down to the creek, freaking out, found me on a rock, crying. Where is he? Ashley said, with tears in her eyes. All I could do was shrug. I was defeated. Ashley and her husband began tracing all the steps I had previously taken. Her husband eventually got in the car and headed back to town to alert the police. I couldn't figure out how Jimmy could get that far in the short amount of time that I didn't hear him laughing. I was praying and crying and suddenly all the surrounding noise began to disappear. I was going into shock. And just then we heard laughing further down the creek. I scrambled to my feet, we all rushed towards the sound, and there, in a small cave-like opening between three boulders, was Jimmy. You could barely see him, but his voice showed us where to look. He was talking fast and laughing like he was playing with somebody. Jimmy, we all screamed, and Ashley reached inside to pull him out. He resisted, and he said he wanted to stay inside playing with his new friend. I started to reach for him to hug him tight, but just then, I saw it and I could not believe what I was seeing. In his hands was my husband's dream catcher, in perfect condition, just like the day I laid it in his coffin. You don't think, Ashley started to say, realizing how ridiculous it sounded. We stared at each other as the police sirens approached in the distance. Do you think it was Dad? I'm sending this in anonymously, You'll understand why after hearing the story. Earlier this year, I moved to New Mexico. I'm originally from Philadelphia, and moving out west was a huge culture shock. Between the sheer emptiness of the place and the long drives, I almost felt like I was in another country. I had moved in with my aunt, who lived alone. She was getting older and was finding it hard to take care of herself after my uncle passed. And since I didn't really have much going on back home... I volunteered to go out to stay with her for a while and just help with things around the house. I worked remotely anyway. I love my aunt and the little town she lives in is beautiful and the locals are all extremely nice. Nothing like back home. But it was boring for me because I didn't know anybody. I mean, how much Netflix can you possibly watch? So, looking for something to do, I did the logical thing and I made a Tinder profile. I matched with a few different girls, and some of them were nice enough, but they all lived pretty far away. Eventually, I met this cute girl named Emily, and we really started hitting it off. But she lived 90 minutes away in Santa Fe, which by New Mexico standards was right down the road. A few days later, I ended up driving out to meet her for a date, and we had a great time. We both wanted to see each other again, so I made plans to come back the following Friday. Little did I know that that Friday night would be the most terrifying night of my life. The roads out west are dark, and I don't mean dim or kind of hard to see. I mean pitch black, can't see Jack, dark. I was sort of getting used to it, but it still kind of bugged me out. Anyway, Emily had to work until 8 p.m., so I planned to pick her up from the house at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, I was kind of banking on her letting me stay over since I didn't want to drive home at 3 a.m., so I'd been driving for about 45 minutes and I had only passed two other cars on the road. And the last one had been 20 minutes prior. So then I was fiddling with the radio trying to find a station and I subconsciously slowed the car down quite a bit. And that's what 
probably saved the guy's life. At least, initially. I just happened to glance up, and at the last second, I saw somebody frantically waving their arms in the middle of the road, right in front of my car. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late, and I simultaneously felt and heard the impact. Luckily, they were off to the side a bit, but the person was still hurled back about ten feet away, and my car made this horrific screeching noise as I came to a stop. Now my Jeep is pretty old and didn't have airbags, but luckily my seatbelt stopped me from slamming my head on the wheel. After a second, I came to the realization that I had just hit somebody. I was shaking so badly that it took me a few seconds to unclip my seatbelt, but when I did, I opened the car and I ran outside to the body laying in the road. It was a young guy, probably early 20s or so. He wasn't wearing a shirt and his jeans were all torn up and he was missing a shoe. As far as I could tell, he was unconscious, but breathing. I ran back to the car to get my cell phone, but of course you don't get service here because I was literally in the desert. I wasn't sure what to do at this point, so I just went back to the guy and crouched down next to him. I got a good look at him at this point and realized he was very unhealthy looking, emaciated, and sort of sick looking. I sat there for another minute or so weighing my options, which is when I heard something coming out of the darkness on the side of the road. It sounded like a growl, a growl that a house dog would make, only it was throatier, almost like a choking or gargling sound. I don't have the words to really explain it, but it wasn't a noise I had ever heard any living creature make. Trying to convince myself it was a coyote or something, I grabbed the guy under the armpits and I started dragging him back to my jeep. I was going to put him in the passenger seat and just drive to the hospital in Santa Fe or flag somebody down for help if I got the chance. When I got to the passenger side of the car, I realized the door was locked. Luckily, I was driving with my window down, so I laid the guy down gently and I walked around to the other side and unlocked the door. I walked to the trunk of my Jeep thinking maybe I had some clothes or something to cover him up with. At least I could try to make him comfortable. But not finding anything useful, I closed the trunk and I walked back to the passenger side. The guy was now sitting up. His shoulders were pumping up and down rapidly, though, almost like he was hyperventilating. I was behind him, but it seemed like he was staring at something straight ahead, right where the headlights were pointing. I looked up. This thing was standing in the dead center of the road. It was on all fours, but its hind legs were twice as long as its front giving it this weird sloping angle. It had this row of needle-thin quills running up its spine, each about a foot long, it seemed like. It was salivating, something vicious and black. Steam was rising from the pavement where it dripped in thick clumps. Even hunched down the way it was, it still had to be taller than my six-foot-one. The three of us were completely still at this point, almost like we were waiting for the other to act. The guy decided it would be him. He let out a scream that seemed like it filled the entire desert. I don't know how he did it, but one second he was sitting down, and the next he was sprinting off down the road, into the darkness. The creature opened its mouth impossibly wide, and then it let out its own scream, perfectly mimicking the tone and pitch that the guy had just made. I bolted for the back of the jeep. I felt something hard slam into the hood, and I just stood crouched in the silence. I waited a few minutes, the whole time hearing the guy screaming repeatedly, but getting farther and farther away. I couldn't see the guy or the creature. My heart was pounding and I was trying not to throw up. After a few minutes, I stood up, looked through the rearview windshield, and I didn't see anything. So I crept up along the side of my car, got to the door, and quietly opened it. And that's when I heard the same scream again, this time right behind me. One hand on the door, I pulled it open jumped in the car and shut it behind me. Something hard hit the side of my Jeep and for a split second, I thought it was going to tip. I never turned the car off, luckily, so I just reached down and pushed down on the gas. Of course, the car was in park, the engine just strained like it was about to burst. So I reached up with my hand, shifted into drive, and the car leapt forward. I drove about 50 feet, shifted myself so that I was sitting properly, and then kept on driving. I left the guy out there in the desert, alone with that thing. I'm ashamed. I can't be certain, but there's a good chance that the guy is dead. And I'm partly, if not totally, to blame. I never went to see Emily that night. I drove till I hit an intersection and just ended up taking the long way back to my aunt's. I know that I'm a horrible person. Now this is partly a confession and partly a warning. A warning 
that there is something unnatural living and hunting out in the desert of New Mexico. <laughs>